And I'll keep my video off since my internet is so bad. slowly introduce today's um, virtual seminar. Welcome everyone. Today we are super happy to have our own Karen Makur telling us about 20 years out of Progresa, one of the you know very interesting and I guess seminal programs around the world. Um, and this, this is you know potentially there are many um, participants who have been here before as you know, uh, Karen will tell us about uh, her research for the next hour, and then we'll open up the mic in the last 15 minutes. Um, you know, in this first hour, please feel free to write down your questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom, and uh, we'll pass them on to Karen at somewhat regular intervals. Uh, we might not be able to get all the questions to Karen, uh, so please don't be offended if that doesn't happen for every question, but we'll try to do our best for that. Um, we all know the ground rules, you know, this is a very nice environment, so please keep it that way. And I guess I have no much else to say, but uh, thanking Karen for uh, this um, beautiful uh, talk that is coming. Um, and just the floor is yours, Karen. Uh, you might want to share the slides. Thanks, uh, Giacomo. Uh, and uh, Thanks everybody for coming. It's great to be on the other side of this for a uh, change. So the work I'm going to present is joined with Carida Rauchu from the Inter-American Development Bank and is going to talk about a program that many of you have heard a lot about already, uh, the, the, the arguably kind of the first large scale conditional cash transfer program in the world, uh, Progressa. But so what's going to be new here is that this is evidence uh, 20 years um, after the start. So. Before I do that, let me motivate a little bit why this may be a useful thing to do. Um, the, you know, when we, when we have programs, so Progressa or the conditional cash transfer programs, the first generation of conditional cash transfer programs as they started in Latin America had both an objective of kind of immediate poverty uh, um, alleviation and investments in human capital. Now, when we talk about interventions, investing in human capital, we, you know, implicitly, um, uh, think of the long-term returns to that human capital, but of course we need to wait a long time before we can show evidence of whether those long-term uh, returns actually exist and how they materialize uh, in, uh, in, 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 in real life. So the question is when, when you do these human capital interventions early in children's life, do the, do, does that human capital gain, do those gains persist, first of all, uh, but also do they lead to better outcomes once these children have grown up and have entered uh, adult life? Now, there's growing evidence from intervention at school ages uh, in, in low- and middle-income countries, uh, including, uh, for instance, a 20-year uh, dewarming paper that was presented in this series uh, last year, um, 
Interestingly, uh, there is actually less evidence uh, to date on interventions that target early childhood, so nutrition or health or stimulation uh, very early with some very notable exceptions of, of relatively small scale RCTs that were followed uh, in the case of the Jamaica stimulation program uh, for uh, more than uh, for 30 years now. Um, the, uh, and that's, that's kind of uh, the, the reason I'm saying kind of making this contrast is because of course, there is, an, there is a whole uh, debate about uh, kind of uh, linked to kind of the literature started by Heckman or framed by Heckman in terms of investment during school age versus early childhood. Uh, and so the, the conditional cash transfer program will, will allow us to uh, look at this, uh, at this question also, because at least the, 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 the Mexican program that we'll talk about uh, in, invested both in nutrition and health early in life, but also then uh, in education uh, later in life. Now, the reason why we don't have tons of evidence, of course, on, on, on uh, kind of human capital interventions on the long term is partly because a lot of the, the policy innovations uh, that, that we know from, from, from the literature kind of are relatively recent and there's kind of been a lot of evaluation and rigorous evaluations happening um, over the, indeed over the last uh, 20 years. So it's only now uh, that those children uh, are old enough or starting to become old enough to look at this long-term question. The other reason, of course, is that it's a hard question because over 20 years, people move, and in particular young people move around a lot, uh, which makes it hard to know where they go um, uh, and, 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 and to keep track of them. But it also, of course, makes it interesting because those moves are part of, of what, what we're actually interested in uh, as, as, as development economists. And so indeed, you know, this, in that sense, this, this paper also relates to this kind of the, the bigger literature on, on, on human capital in rural, area, rural areas in the developing world and the rural or agricultural productivity gap, uh, the literature on kind of the misallocation of labor between sectors about moving uh, uh, labor between sectors. Uh, is it is it um, is there a productivity gap or is it selection? Is that selection related to human capital? And of course, then also what are the returns to migration? So those are the broader literatures uh, that this paper will, will link to. Now, when we then focus on conditional cash transfer specifically, so this was a major policy innovation in, in 1997 where the Mexican government uh, designed this completely new program, uh, a new approach to investment uh, in, in, in simultaneously investment in human capital and poverty reduction. Um, that uh, that rapidly so that that had a rigorous uh, that also was innovative for its rigorous uh, evaluation design, um, and that rapidly became uh, the national program in Mexico, but also in many other countries uh, in Latin America, and in fact that scaled globally to more than eighty countries. Um, so this is a particular a, a, a particular important program to to look for the long term evidence uh, because of that. Now, we actually know quite a bit already in terms of, of the medium term uh, effects of, of both the Mexican program and the programs that were designed uh, uh, following uh, its, 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 um, its, its logic. And almost ever, so if you look at the evidence from somewhere between five and 13 years, so what I'm, what I'm calling here the medium term evidence, uh, almost everywhere you find gains in schooling, uh, so from being exposed in school age. So children, these programs kind of offer transfers conditional on staying in school. And so you one you can show systematically pretty much that if you go back five or ten years later, this led to a higher schooling. The evidence of the of the impacts of exposure in early childhood is is scarcer. So there's less studies that look at it, but it's also mixed. There's some that find fade out uh, of the of the cognitive gains that were achieved early on. There is some uh, that suggest the kind of gains in, in early schooling. Um, and if we look at the labor market uh, outcomes, so the kind of the, 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 when we really think of the returns uh, to education question, also there the evidence to date is quite mixed. Um, so people have looked at labor market outcomes at earnings and migrations. Partly there's kind of methodological challenges that I already hinted at, kind of when people move, uh, it's harder to, uh, you, you, you often have uh, problems of attrition. Uh, and so zero results become hard to interpret. Uh, but also, and conceptually, as, as when you looked kind of 10 years later, very often those, the people that were in school uh, benefiting from the interventions may still be transitioning into adulthood, they're young adults, they're moving between schooling and the labor market. And so often they're still too young to really understand, or they were still too young to understand the, 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 the long-term question. So 
what we what, what I'm going to talk about today is is basically an, 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 a longer term look at, at this question, so a 20 year look. And before doing that, I'll give a quick refresher of, of PROGRESSA. Um, many of you will, will know it, but just so we're all on the same page in terms of both the design of the program and of the evaluation. I'm going to then explain the method we used uh, to, to look at this 20 year um, uh, at the 20 year uh, story. Uh, talk obviously about attrition and, and tracking since since I, I motivated that, but also give you some descriptives um, in terms of the of, of over this 20 year horizon, um, showing you that there is a tremendous amount of geographical indication mobility, even just at the cross section that is worth kind of uh, taking stock of before we start thinking of uh, uh, impacts or in fact differential impacts uh, that I'm going to be talking about. And so then I'm going to focus on on two cohorts kind of thinking of the, you know, the two components of the program, the, the cohorts that benefited from the health nutrition early in life. So those children will be our, our young adults 20 years later in 2017 um, and are entering the labor market uh, at the moment we observe them. Uh, and then the other cohort that was uh, benefited while they were in school, that is 29 to 35 years old, uh, when they uh, when we observed them in 2017, so they have fully transitioned uh, into adulthood, uh, have formed their own households, etc., and so allowed to tell a, a fuller story. I'll, I'll, I'll compare um, so a fuller story where we'll say more about income and about their mobility, but then also we'll we'll, we'll compare these two cohorts uh, to see the the, the the parallels between them, and then time permitting, I'll say a little bit about the siblings. So basically, all the other cohorts. Uh, because you may have questions if you just focus on those two, you know, is, isn't that missing? Isn't that uh, missing a part of the of the picture? And, and the siblings will help us understand a bit about the mechanism too. So, um, quick refresher on on the design. So I'm going to talk here about the the design of Progressa as it was in the very early years of the program. So it was uh, designed as a national program with this rigorous evaluation, um, and it, at that at the initial stage. Uh, had sizable transfers that were given to mothers of households that were selected to be eligible based on, on a poverty uh, indicator. And those households were living uh, in villages selected to, to, to be uh, 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 relatively marginal, so poor villages um, uh, based on, on the marginality index. Mothers got money, got transfers, conditional on, on, on basically three behaviors for the children from zero to five um, they uh, had to take them to health checkups. The adults also had uh, checkups um, uh, less regularly, and there was nutritional supplements to pregnant mothers and these young children. The second conditionality was for children that were in school, and in particular in the fourth to sixth grade of primary school, or the first three grades of secondary school, so the first uh, of what I'm going to call lower secondary, um, those children were uh, supposed to attend, to be enrolled in school and to be attending 85% uh, of the time. And then the mothers uh, of the children were also uh, supposed to attend these information sessions where they were given information about their nutrition, how to invest in health and, and, and in education practices. Um, the program was scaled up uh, nationally and, and indeed much beyond. It changed names a few times, so you may have heard about Oportunidades or Prospera, but so I'm going to talk about this initial uh, pro program. And the reason I'm doing that is because the, the experimental design was on, the, was on 506 villages that were part of the, the initial, uh, the programs that were targeted in, in the early years, uh, where two thirds of those villages was selected to start getting transfers in May 98. And the one third of the villages uh, was delayed to get transfers until November 99. And so this is the experimental design that people then have used to look at uh, you know, many different outcomes, uh, uh, both on the very short term and also on, on, on the medium term, including the work by, by Giacomo in, in, in two, a bit of 2003 data. Um, the initial take-up was very high, so 97%. Uh, now, afterwards, uh, the, the, those, uh, these families continued uh, transfers in, indeed for quite a lot, a long time. Uh, and, and so, and basically until they graduate, which means they have no more children, uh, of those age groups, um, of any of those age groups, uh, and, and at that point, they were kind of phased out. So we know a lot about the short-term effects of this program from, from a large literature that, that, that Susan Parker and Petra Todd uh, summarized in, in, in a GL article in 2017. Um, 
we know, uh, the, so I'm going to focus on the ones that are, the, the evidence that is relevant for, for, for this paper. So we know in particular that there, there was higher investments in health improvement in, in self-reported health, but also in anemia uh, and, and, in, and in heights observed measures of, 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 well, of health of those young, of those what we'll call the young cohorts. For education, uh, the, 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 the evidence shows a very, uh, the, the, the initial evidence shows that there was a very strong uh, impact for the children that were uh, just on the transition from primary to secondary school, especially for the girls. And so the paper by, by Paul Schultz, the initial paper by Paul Schultz, and then subsequently other papers showing that made it. So being on that in this transition, kind of benefiting from the program, just as we were transitioning between phases, led to a five percentage point increase in enrollment for the boys and up to 10 percentage point increase for the girls. Um, on the medium term, so after six and 10 years, um, we, the, the evidence is more mixed. So for the younger cohorts, there was an effort to, to measure uh, cognitive gains um, of, of, of a part of that cohort, and, and, and the evidence is, is, is not entirely uh, unambiguous. For the older cohorts, so the ones that benefited from the education, we know that uh, even uh, when you look at them um, in 2000 or even in 2003, the gains in schooling were remained, uh, but it was on, but under gains uh, were unclear, including it wasn't clear whether children actually were learning much in school. And so this resonates very much with the current debate about the learning crisis in, you know, middle and low income countries across the world. Kids have gotten more into school, but there's a big question on whether they actually are learning into school. And so the evidence of, of, uh, of, of Mexico fits wide into, into that debate. And then finally, as, as you'll see, a part of today's story is going to be about international migration. Um, this is Mexico, so that means international migration to the US in particular. Um, there was some evidence from the short term results too on international migration, which is actually also mixed. Um, but important to say is this, the, the, the evidence that exists is, on, is basically on the parents of the children that I'm going to be looking at. Um, and, and so not directly relevant for, for what we're looking at here. So, so what are we doing? Uh, but let me actually stop for, to see whether there's any questions before I'm saying what we're doing. No, Karen, you can go ahead, actually. Seems like uh, you're doing a great job to describe the program. So go on. And, and lots of people know it. Um, so, um, so what did we do in 2017? So in 2017, we organized a, uh, what we call a tracking survey. So we do a survey kind of keeping in mind that um, attrition was going to be the big, the likely very big challenge here after 20 years when we're interested in those on, in, in the children of the beneficiaries. Um, and the reason why that, that why we had a hunch this was going to be a big issue is because in in 2007, so 10 years earlier, for the for the kids that benefited from the educational part of the program, the 2007 survey already loses 60 percent of that cohort at that stage. So you know another 10 years later. Uh, we were very worried about uh, about uh, finding, you know, any of them or, 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 or hardly any of them. Um, in addition, this is 2017. The, the security situation in uh, the domestic security situation in, in Mexico is 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 complicated uh, with with certain territories in, in 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 basically in control of 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 criminal gangs. But also, Trump just got elected in in the U.S. Uh, and so you have international migration tensions uh, making it difficult to get contact information about people that may be legally or illegally uh, in the United States. Uh, we're talking about people that are between 20 and 30 years old, uh, so, so very mobile cohorts. And we also knew that 40% uh, of the households were, had no longer, not only were they no longer beneficiaries of the program, but they also had no longer any kind of ties to the program. Um, our estimates were moreover that 20% of the original households were no longer living in the village. And so given that that, that kind of was the, the, the picture, uh, we kind of said, okay, let's try to see whether we actually can find these kids and focus a lot on that. So limit the nutrition. And when we find them, obtain basic information about them. So short um, survey to get some basic key information about them. Um, the... Um, and so what do we do is so we collect information on, on key indicators of education, labor market, and demographic outcomes. And we also decided to only focus on those two cohorts uh, to, to have a targeted kind of uh, uh, tracking effort. And so the two cohorts are basically conceptually the ones that were transitioning to the labor market and the ones that had finished uh, transitioning into adulthood. So, so let me explain or let me motivate th those two uh, cohorts better. Um, so 
we know that there is kind of going back to the initial experimental design, there was um, what we so we're looking 20 years later, and so we're trying to say, you know, is there some of that initial experimental variation that we can still use to say something about long-term returns, knowing that after the initial 18 months, the, the households had all had gotten the problem for a very long time, up to, up to indeed 20 years, if, even if you know many didn't get quite 20 years because the children would have been too old uh, to continue. Um, and so what we said is like, well, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the two cohorts for whom those 18 months difference in, in, in exposure to the program came at a moment, at a stage of life that is particularly important for human capital formation, or at least that is considered based on the literature or based on the early evidence to be important uh, for human capital accumulation. So the first group, which we'll call the early childhood cohort, is basically the children for whom those 18 months difference fell in the first thousand days of life. So children that were exposed in utero or very early in life versus 18 months later. So those are the ones that I was referring to as the, the young adults, so the ones that will be 18 to 20 in 2017. And then the second group is basically directly motivated by the early evidence from, from Paul Schultz and others that had shown that the, the children that specifically benefited from the education intervention, or that mostly benefited, I should say, from the education transfers and the ed education conditionalities were the kids that had been transitioning from primary to secondary school in 98. So if you were in sixth grade, uh, in 98, uh, when, the, when the transfer stopped, you were more likely to continue into lower secondary school and indeed uh, to, to continue uh, as, as the medium term evidence had shown it all the way to finishing lower secondary school. In contrast, that same kid that was in a control village finished second, uh, uh, primary school, didn't get any transfers, dropped out at that point, And by the time the program started in his village, 18 months later, may not have re-enrolled. And that's indeed, as I said, kind of what, what the evidence had showed. And so we knew there was that difference on the short term, kind of saying, OK, that means that, that, this, is, that this is a cohort worth looking uh, on the long term. First of all, whether that educational difference maintains, and then if it does, um, that that experiment, the, the, the difference that was created by the experimental variation, how can we then use that to say something about the long-term returns uh, to that human capital? The, now, when I say the long-term returns to human capital, it's worth thinking about a little bit, what is it here that we're really picking up? Um, so what we know from the, again, from the medium-term evidence, these children were more likely to have finished lower secondary school. They may or may not have learned more because they finished three more years of schooling. Um, independently of whether they learned more or not, they had an additional level of schooling. They had, you know, had a certificate for lower secondary. But in addition to that, going to lower secondary school in Mexico and indeed in many other countries in the world often means in rural settings that you go to school outside of your village of origin because that's the, the secondary schools are more likely to be in the, in the municipal kind of town. Um, and so you kind of, by going to school, became mechanically more mobile. You kind of had left uh, the village to go to school. And by leaving the village to go to school, you also had been exposed to a different network because, of course, in those schools, in the towns, you have other kids uh, from, more, uh, from less disadvantaged backgrounds that are in those same schools. And of course, given the importance of networks for migration, that's, that's a potential key um, mechanism to keep in mind. And so, so the, 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 what the experimental shock does for, for, for these kids is it creates a difference in the level in schooling, which could um, change any of those and probably change all of them uh, at the same time. So that group of kids is then uh, 29 to 35 uh, in, when, when, we, when we try to look for them in, in 2017. Um, the, um, I should say one more thing, which is that the I, I kind of hinted at this already. But so, so the if I look at, when we look at the at the at the early kids, the early childhood cohort, those are that's a group of kids for which we um, for which there is actually very little evidence uh, uh, of of twenty year returns uh, of any program in early childhood, uh, at least at, at at the scale of the of the program of progressing. Okay. So then we, since we put a lot of effort in trying to find these two groups of people, we kind of then purposely have a very narrow set of outcomes uh, because part of the reason we do that is because we, were, we wanted to be able to combine in-person with phone surveys. So we're just gonna have educational attainment, destination, geographical mobility, 
household formation and fertility, and some basic information about occupation. For the, in the, for the people that we interviewed directly, um, we'll also have their income. Uh, we'll have their, uh, for the younger ones, we asked their income expectations, exactly because they were too young very often to have completely transitioned into the labor market. Um, we, we, and because we wanted to have an uncensored outcome on, 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 on some indicator on income uh, towards the future, we, can, uh, we asked them their income expectations when they were 30, so kind of to be able also to compare with that older cohorts. Of course, the, the, the cost of being a, of doing combining in-person with phone surveys is that we can't do any testing. We couldn't do any cognitive or, or learning outcomes. So we can't get back to that question, which had been looked at uh, already in, in the medium term. Um, and we have some very limited information about job quality. So okay. why did I say here, um, kind of for those that we individually interviewed, is because if we couldn't manage to interview the individual, we asked the questions uh, on, 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 the, on the outcomes mentioned in the top to basically the mother uh, of, of, of the individual, like you would uh, in, in many uh, household surveys. Karen, there are a couple of clarification questions, I guess that's a good time now maybe to think about. One is about, you know, what was the sense of anticipation of the control village with respect to the program coming in a year and a year and a half? Um, and the other one was, um, so was 998, uh, it's just one year before the program went national, um, or I guess this is actually part of, you know, was the program expanded after 998 to urban location as well? I guess that's the, the way to interpret that question. Uh, and uh, the last one is Sylvie, who has a question about um, the things are moving around or not. <laughs> oh, yeah. So does it happen that the young cohort is actually older sibling treated in the school cohort? Um, so I guess, yeah. Um, so, and yeah, I'll let you answer this once for now. Yeah, so on the, let me go in backward order. So I'll come back to the siblings at, at the end of the talk. And so indeed there are, there is some, there is clearly going to be some overlap. There's going to be some um, uh, uh, children that, that, that have, uh, that happen to have both kids in, in the, in, in, so there's going to be lots of kids that have an older sibling that is in school um, uh, and, and, and younger siblings. And there's going to be some where we, households where you, where you have both. So we have, uh, I think we have 7,000, so we have close to 7,000 individuals, but it's 5,500 households or something like that. Um, the, so the program, so, so I'll, I'll, say, I'll say a little bit more of the sample, but so the sample I'm going to talk about is the sample that was drawn from cent seven central states of those marginal villages. The program indeed uh, in 2000 was scaled nationally, so to all, all states in Mexico and to the urban areas uh, too, and, 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 and state like that. Uh, in, until, uh, in fact, 2017, um, the, of 2018. The, um, uh, on anticipation, um, that, that, that's a, a good question. The, the, this is certainly something that, that the short-term uh, evidence have, has looked at closer than I have, and I should look back at that, um, uh, unless, uh, Giacomo, you know the answer to this question. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, Typically, Mexico tended to change programs every now and then. So the sense of anticipation seemed to be, you know, the program wasn't really confirmed. And uh, I mean, when we looked at the anticipation, we didn't find much of that. Um, so. um, and then oh, the, there's oh, one oh, last question, maybe it is worth, uh, you know, just, just a clarification about the building up of the sample. Uh, did the, does the sample include for 2017, both control and treatment villages? Uh, yes, of course. The, well, more than control and treatment villages, it's going to be people that used to live way back when uh, in those treatment and control villages, right? So, so let me explain the sample better. Um, so the so the, the there was a census done in 1997 in those 506 villages, and then the data that that Giacomo was referring to uh, did so every six months. The Mexican government went back. And, and surveyed everybody in those uh, 506 villages uh, again um, for up till 2000. Uh, and then they did this one more time in 2003 and in 2007. Um, so those are 506 villages in the rural uh, areas of, of seven central states. So that was 24,000 households up to 125,000 individuals. 
Um, and that was representative for broad, for five regions, so five geoclimatical regions in those seven states, uh, and uh, also by population size. So there was four groups of, of, of village population size. Um, and so the, the so when when I said when I said before there was sixty percent attrition in some cohorts, so that was in a context where the government had tried to find those one hundred twenty five thousand individuals, uh, which of course was a, was a very difficult thing to do. Um, so. What we're going to do here is to say, well, let's focus on, 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 the, on those two cohorts for whom there should be a first stage, if you want to, on, on, on the education. So the older cohorts, uh, we are e easy to identify. They're the kids that are in fifth grade in 1997 in both the treatment and the control. But the younger cohort are a little bit more tricky, but not that much. So either they were born in 97 already, so they're in the program census, or we see in the 98 or in the 19, we see them appearing basically in the 98 or the 99 surveys. Uh, so they, it's uh, kids uh, born in those first years of the program. The short term evidence doesn't show um, evidence on, of impacts of fertility of the program. Of course, it could be, hetero, it could be treatment heterogeneity on fertility. So all the results I'm going to show them are actually robust to excluding 99, which is the cohort that is potentially endogenous because it, it's the people conceived or the kids conceived after the start of the program. No, there was 47 villages um, that the, where the survey company and uh, the program, uh, so the Prospera's uh, national team agreed that at the moment we're doing the survey were too dangerous to go into. So because of, so, the, so I, I was describing you the security situation before. And so there is 47 villages that, that, that uh, were, was not responsible to send survey teams to. Uh, those were mostly in Michoacan and Guerrero. So for those of you who know Mexico, that's not going to be a surprise. Um, and a few in Veracruz. Now, because the sample, the initial sample was, was uh, designed to be representative kind of by region and by population size, we can kind of use those five regions and four groups to basically construct the 20 strata that it was for. And then we see that, um, so Michoacan and Guerrero actually were two of the five regions. And so because of that, we can, so we see that, that the, those 47 villages are concentrated in seven of the 20 strata. So the 47 villages are not correlated to initial treatment assignments. So the balance is, and the balance is maintained, uh, the baseline balance is maintained when we take them out. So we checked that before we, 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 uh, we did this. Um, that may sound surprising for those of you who used to think about, you know, how programs affect conflict. But remember that this is 20 years later and both groups of villages have been getting the program for a very long time. It's just that 20 years back, one of them had started a bit earlier than the others. And so that probably explains why, why this is balanced. Now they are poorer uh, villages. And so, so this, this is possibly uh, leads to an external validity issue. So we're gonna deal with this in a couple of different ways. So we did not go back to those 47. So we excluded them uh, from our sample uh, because I was not uh, responsible to do so. Um, we will, uh, the results I'm going to show you um, are, uh, so this is the sample without them. Um, we will, however, if you want to say something about kind of the, the going back to the sample we had, we can overweigh the other observations in the strata uh, to see uh, whether it affects the results or doesn't. We can also do something much more punishing in terms of statistical power, and we can take all the observations out in the seven strata. So then we are, uh, we have a sample that is, that is balanced in the remaining 13 strata. Um, and, uh, and, and the results are also uh, robust to that, although we, we do lose power, obviously. Um, okay, so once we had our sample, so that's about 7,000 individuals, what did we do? So we first uh, go to uh, the initial villages. We tried to find who have it there. If they're not there themselves, their mothers, we had the support of the program that explained um, uh, why uh, we were doing this. Um, Again, to get around this mistrust issue, we do a proxy interview with the mother, uh, we get contact information, and then we either do, if you have the contact information by phone, we do the survey by phone if we can, we go look for them if they're there, and then in phase two, we basically go look all over Mexico, uh, no matter where they went, um, but also uh, by phone and, and, and including in the US, we call people and do the surveys by phone. And so it's because we wanted to be able to do this mixed approach that we kept the survey very short. Um, did this work? Um, so the, 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 the short answer is, I guess, is this number here. So uh, we have information after 20 years of 93% of the individuals uh, we looked at. Uh, that's about the same for each of those cohorts. 
Um, it's 85% when we, when we talk about the people that we talk directly to. So the remaining ones is that we got the information from their models. Um, so a, a big part of this is, is the phone, or an important part of this is the phone survey. Um, and then uh, in the end, so if you have 93%, so the ones we don't have is 2% have died, 1% refused, uh, and then 3% are people for which the contact information was not good enough uh, to find them. Um, is it balanced? And so the, the, the good news is yes. And in fact, it is balanced, in, you know, no matter which way we, we look at uh, in terms of the way we survey them, which is, which is also helpful. And that's true for the both the cohorts. Uh, of course, that wasn't true after the first phase, but it's, it, it's true as a result of the intensive tracking. Uh, it's also, uh, and, the, and the correlates of attrition are also similar be between treatment and control. Again, the, 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 the idea that this is a differential helps explain that, I think. Um, in terms of mortality, there is no, there is no uh, differential. So the people we're losing because of that are, are not different. Okay, so in the, I told you an important part of the story is the geographic mobility. So to, to help you understand that, this is in fact a map of where the children were in 1997. So before we, before the program started. So these are the, the, the seven central states I mentioned. So Mexico City is gonna be here in the middle. Of course, there's no observations here. Um, and as you saw, it's not just in the seven central states, but it's also kind of in the highlands, basically in the poorer areas of, of those states. So not on, not on the coasts. Uh, and that's by design because these were marginal villages. Indeed, 44% of the, of, the, of the baseline population is, is indigenous. So this is where they were in 1997. This is where they are uh, 20 years later. So the, 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 the part of the map that we were looking at before is this little one. So that's kind of what these extracts are. So people moved in, in the region where they lived in all kinds of different directions, including to the coasts. But then more important, or more interestingly, possibly, is they moved all over Mexico. Uh, and, but they also moved in many different places in the US. And so there's a tremendous amount of, of mobility um, uh, in, after after these 20 years. So these are the numbers that that, that show that uh, in, in a different way. Uh, so 12% of the school cohort, so the school cohort is what, is, is what I was referring to, the cohort for whom the experimental variation ha happens uh, at the transition of primary to secondary school. So 12% of them are in, are in the US, uh, much less of the early ones. So the 18, 20 year olds is, is, is much less. I'll come back to this. Um, more than the majority of both groups is outside of their village of, village of origin, so they have moved away. Um, indeed, uh, more uh, kind of forty percent of the older group is even in a different state. And if we look of where they are in Mexico, they're in all kinds of places. So they are uh, not just in the big cities. Um, not just remember Mexico City is, would have been, you may have thought would be the natural place to go. It was in the middle of, of all these states. So the metropolitan areas here is, is the three, you know, big, big metropolitan areas of, of Mexico. Many of them are there, but many more of them are in other urban areas and, and a fair bit are in semi urban or, or, or rural municipalities. Um, so they cover 30 of the 32 states and, and 28 states uh, in, in, in the US. That's the geographic mobility. Now, the other part of the mobility, of course, that interests us is, is the educational mobility. And so to, to say something about educational mobility, it's useful to compare the kids with their parents. And so the, the first line here, or the first two columns are the, are the household heads. Um, and so they, on average, a household head was 44 years old. And then what we're gonna do is look at the household heads that are about the same age, then the cohort that we look uh, for 20 years later, so about 30. So household heads in this population were had very low levels of education. So we often think, you know, Mexico is a middle income country. You know, 20 years ago, uh, in this population, the, the uh, household heads had about three years of education, so low levels of education. Uh, that's a bit, you know, it's four years, basically, if you look at, at the younger household heads. Their children have three times more uh, education. So kind of you have a, a tremendous uh, educational mobility. So the ones that are 30 years old have almost nine, and then the ones that are the, the younger cohort at an additional year. And so we see that also in a different way if we look at, at kind of levels. So kind of the higher secondary level is the one that we've been talking about. 
um, normally basically had that level um, 20 years ago. And now you have a substantial, sorry, and we were talking about a lower secondary uh, where the vast majority gets that and then the higher secondary, you get some too. And then 23% of the 18 to 20 year olds are still studying, meaning that for them, the story is not finished. So we're observing them basically very much in this transition, but some of them are still studying, some of them are not. And, and so that's important to keep in mind uh, for the interpretation. These levels, as, as, as impressive as this may look like, and this is just descriptive, okay? This is not a program. This is just what's happening in these villages in these 20 years. Um, um, so as, as impressive as this looks like, it's important to kind of put this in the context of the country as a whole, where of course, everybody's getting much more education. And indeed, uh, the, at the national level, uh, the this cohort, so the people of that same cohort at the national level would have had uh, about one and a half year more on average uh, for the early childhood cohort, they're also still doing better. Now, they're doing better than the rural cohorts on, on average, which is remarkable so given that they were selected um, from marginal places. But remember, many of them are not in rural places anymore. right? So, the, so the, the, the reason why this matters is if we want to think of the return to education on the labor market, we need to think about what is the labor market these kids are working on in, and they're basically in a, you no know, adults in the labor market where lots of other people also have a lot of education and indeed probably much more education. Okay, so what are we going to do? So we're gonna, I'm gonna basically show you something very simple, an ITT of the, of the differential effect of these 18 months earlier exposure. What I'm not gonna show you, but, 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 but you'll have to take my word for it, is that the results are robust to either adding controls with the kind of the double robust uh, uh, machine learning approaches to using weights to account for the village selection, uh, to limiting the sample to start out without a security issue, uh, to using or not the proxy information, and to excluding uh, the, the potential uh, endogenous uh, cohort born in 99. Okay. Um, I see Giacomo is not interrupting me, so I'm going to continue. Okay, so the first results. So this is first graphically. The first result, what, what interests us for the early childhood cohort, remember, we actually know not much about them. We know they had better health and nutrition early in life. 20 years later, we see that they have indeed more education. So the early, uh, the 18 months earlier exposure uh, leads to a shift in the educational distribution at all levels. And so let me show you the the, the the numbers because that's easier to read. So on average, they have about the 18 months earlier exposure leads to about uh, a third of a year more of, of grades attained when these kids are 20. And the gains happen at all levels of education. So we see they, they're more likely to have finished primary, lower secondary, upper secondary, including uh, already some university. Um, and if you look at these higher levels, the percentage increases compared to the core mean are, are relatively high. Um, they're still studying, as I mentioned, but there's no differential here, although the, the point estimate is positive. So possibly these are small underestimates of what, what the final uh, result will be. So the early childhood exposure or earlier exposure in early childhood, which remember, these are cohorts that subsequently then both of them uh, sorry, these are groups of kids where both the early and, and the late treatment would have continued to benefit from the program afterwards. So having started 18 months earlier, 20 years later leads to higher levels of education. These impacts are somewhat stronger for, for women. So this is going to be throughout uh, the set of results uh, mostly going to be the case where the point estimates are slightly higher for women. No, almost none of the differences is significant. Um, and so uh, the... Uh, the you know that's going to be interesting especially for the labor market so i'm showing that kind of mostly for for uh, i guess you know for, to, to give the, the complete picture um they they're learning more do they expect to be earning more uh and so the answer there also is sorry they, i don't know whether they learn more they have higher levels of education do do they um uh, expect to earn more and so the answer is yes there too uh, so first of all, uh, let me focus on, on the last two columns here. Most of them, uh, so not everybody answers the, the expectation questions, but there's no differential there. Um, many of them still expect to continue studying. So 20% of them are still studying. Many of them expect to still re-enroll. So in that sense, this is also an, 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 an incomplete story. Uh, and that's, you know, marginally, uh, uh, so many more, oh, sorry, marginally more 
expect uh, if they were if they were in the early treatment group. But then I guess more more importantly, they expect to earn. So when we're asking them, what do you expect your income is going to be when you're when you're 30? Uh, they um, have uh, expect to to uh, earn about eight percent more, and for women that's about 30 percent. Um, so and and we'll see how that re re uh, relates to the income of the actual older cohort. So the school cohorts for them the education result we knew already kind of because we knew that in 2003 they were more likely to, to finish lower secondary school. And that's still true when, uh, you know, that, that qualitative result is still there. In fact, the point estimate is still very close to what it was, uh, you know, to, to, to the estimate that, that, in fact, in the difference in enrollment that Schultz had found very early on. Uh, of course, these are not studying anymore. They're 30 years old. So for them, the story is, is, is finished. What we didn't know, but we could have expected, is that they didn't get additional levels. And the reason I'm saying we could have expected that is because this cohort, and that's important for the interpretation, basically it's the group of kids that was about to in, in that was about to uh, drop out of school if it wasn't for the push of the of the program. So they are the somewhat marginal kids. They would have finished primary school because of the cash transfers. They basically did the one more level up, but then logically they didn't. There is no differential at, at, at further levels, and, and so. The, 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 the local effect we're identifying for them is that group. It's a group of kids that gets a, a lower secondary, but, but, but nothing more. Um, so the, does that help them uh, in terms of income? See, these are now actual income results. Uh, again, the, the top is, is the total, the, the bottom is just the woman. And so first of all, again, the last column, they're not more likely to be working. Uh, so there is no uh, movement on the ex on the extensive margin, which hides the fact that all the men are working, in fact, uh, and 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 only thirty eight percent of these thirty year old women are um, actively working, meaning economically active with 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 uh, with, with with labor income. So there is no movement on the extensive margin, but on the intensive margin, uh, there clearly is. Um, they are. Uh, they earn uh, about 16% uh, more uh, income 20 years later. Um, and part of the story is they're more likely to have U.S. income. Okay? Uh, and so, the, so that's a four percentage point, but that's a 100% increase uh, of the mean. So they're much more likely to have migrated than to earn income in, in the U.S. And that's also true for the women, again, from a very low mean. Uh, and so for women, because fewer of them are working in part, the, the, the percentage increase. Um, so this is the conditional. Um, it, it, it Karen, um, can, I, can I, I have a couple of questions here? One is about, you know, is there a way that you can use the intensity of exposure? And I'm going to paraphrase a little bit David uh, Margolis question here. So suppose you were to use the household structure to basically, you know, proxy for how long the treatment is going to last for household A versus B. Have you done that type of exercise uh, or are you just uh, sort of considering the 18 months as that is the average difference between these two? Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so we haven't kind of on purpose, uh, the, uh, the, you know, there's a bit of a debate in this. So I, I, I quickly mentioned the kind of the, the ambiguous results uh, for the early childhood court and, and then it relates exactly around, around this question on whether you can take the household composition as, as, as a good uh, way of, uh, you know, it's basically one heterogeneity test like others, and it's not an exogenous source. of And there's a couple of other questions that are about, um, you know, so Danish Salam is asking, so why do you think this is happening? This is just, you know, exposure time of 18 months. Uh, and I guess you're going to speak a little bit more to this, to the mechanism, really. Uh, but, you know, maybe it's a good time to sort of introduce that. And then there's another question that is somewhat related by Mary Alice Stoyle, and it's about were you, were you able to look into a more granular definition of treatment? So it's like the first six months of life versus in utero and so on. Yeah, so indeed, so for, for the young court, uh, time permitting, I'll come back to this. Uh, but the short answer is we have, there is, we, we don't find differences between kids born basically 97, 98 or 99. So we, may, we probably don't have power uh, uh, to do this, but so we don't find strong evidence of within those, within the thousand days, is there a, a period within the thousand days that matters more or less? So that, and I think that relates to the question on, on why these 18 months. So the, the 
I think that's probably a question for the early childhood cohort. Um, so the so we specifically so it's not just eighteen months. It's eighteen months that the medical literature has told us are eighteen critical months in the de- in the brain development and the physical development of children. And so it's at that, so we selected them on purpose, kind of saying the medical literature tells us those are eighteen months that are important. Let's see whether we can find that back. When is that true? Can we find that back? Uh, 20 years later, and if we find it back, how does that translate in other outcomes? Um, so for the for the for the uh, for the older cohorts, I think the 18 months is, is is much simpler. It's just that they got the transfers when they were transitioning. So that's kind of the logic. Um, okay. So so but so let's think further indeed about the mechanism. So the kids that had trans that had been able to I'm I'm all the I'm all the older kids now. The kids that are what we call the school cohort. So with the program, they had completed lower uh, secondary school. We see that they are more likely 20 years later to have US income. So uh, to, so they're more likely to be in the US they, uh, and, and they have a higher total income uh, as a result. Um, the, if we, and so the question then is, is it only the ones in the US? You know, the, the four was 4% and it increases to 8%. And the answer is not quite. So this is the, this is the, the income distribution. Um, so we see that kind of the, the, it's basically the top quartile or the co- top quintile where the action is. So it's not just the U.S. income that makes this. Now, given that we have a shift in the U.S. income, we can't separate the U.S. and the, and the non-U.S. migrants. Um, but we see uh, that it's a little bit more than that. And so then let's look at a bit more at the mobility to, to unpack uh, this story. So we see, in fact, that in addition to the fact that uh, currently there is a number of them in the U.S., um, if we look at the ones that are ever migrated in the US, there's many more of them. And so the so part of the story is 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 is, is one of return migration. So people were in the US uh, and, and, and came back. On average, when we look at them in 2017, um, so they more they uh, they are in 2017 farther away from their village of origin, less likely to live in that village of origin, related to that kind of going back to the mechanism. Uh, possibly because they didn't get their last schooling in the village of origin, given that they got went to school outside of the village to get that lower secondary schooling. But when we see where they live in Mexico, uh, if they're not in the US, they, we also see that they, they, they don't necessarily live, live maybe where you expected them to live. So they don't live in those big metropolitan areas, but rather uh, they live, uh, in fact, they're less likely to li- live in the big metropolitan areas and they live, and they're more likely to live in rural or semi-urban uh, municipalities. And so, on average, the places where they live are, sm- are slightly smaller. And so, the the story that emerges here. Um, sorry, let me skip this because I won't have time. The, sm- the story that emerges here is one where, either because of more networks, or because of going to school outside of the village, or because now I know a little bit of English because I went to lower secondary school, I became more mobile. Um, I moved, many of them moved to the US or came back or moved elsewhere in Mexico where they have a higher return uh, to their, to, to a place where they get a higher return to the additional level of education uh, that they got. Um, we skip this in the interest of time. And so what it is not is occupation. It's not that they do something different. No, maybe that shouldn't be too surprising because with lower secondary education, nine years of education is not that you, you know, become a doctor uh, or a lawyer. Indeed, few of them uh, have any professional, technical or other skilled jobs, only 13 uh, percent. So many of them are, are in, in manual work or in commerce, etc. But so we see no shifts in occupation. So it's not that doing something different is that they are living in a, in a place where they, they get a, a bit higher return uh, to the to the human capital that they got. Um, the other part that is clear in terms of, of which fits in this idea of they move somewhere and then they come back is that we see a, a shift in, in, in basically the start of, of, of adult life. Uh, so they postponed both marriage uh, and, and childbearing with about half a year. And that's true for both the men uh, and, and, and the woman. So they're not more, so the kind of, the, again, the extensive margin is not there. So we can kind of interpret uh, the, 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 the ages and such. And that happens not because they were in school and, and it, so it's not the in, in incarceration effect because it's not teenage pregnancy. As you can see, it is kind of in the middle of the 20s. Uh, they, they basically start a family a little bit later. Uh, 
possibly, again, they migrated, they accumulated, and, and they may have settled. OK, so those are the two, uh, the, 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 the two cohorts. I'll get back to the mobility in a second. But before doing that, um, just kind of remind, so two very different stories in a certain way, because for the early childhood, you have across all levels of education, a shift in education that translates to, to, uh, into incoming expectations. For the older cohort, we only have this shift at a very one specific level. Uh, but that's partly related to how we selected them. So that's not really kind of, an, an, you know, that's kind of the local effect, we're getting at different local effects. What we do see uh, is that um, the, uh, so, so, we, so in that sense, we can't really compare, but what we can, we, but we can still kind of look at, 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 at certain uh, comparisons. Um, and in particular, uh, so let me skip this, uh, at the, the fact that, as I said, across the board, we find impact to be stronger for women. Now, women were the ones that uh, were more constrained, and they still are more constrained. 38% of them only is, is working. Um, so the margin, I guess, uh, to, to move was slightly higher. So that, that's one interpretation of that. Um, but And what we certainly find is this, high, this, is this higher mobility for both. So I'll show you the early childhood in a second. They're also more mobile. They also, again, are more, more likely to have studied outside of the village and indeed further away, the more higher the level of education is. Um, and so possibly as a result, the destinations are different. Indeed, I mentioned this before, the early childhood cohort did not migrate to the US. Um, and, and despite the fact that they didn't migrate to the US, if you want to, their income expectations uh, are still uh, higher. Uh, so what's going on there? So partly, actually, let me first show you this. So why did not migrate into the US? Well, in fact, nobody of that cohort in Mexico was migrating to the US uh, at that same level as the older cohort. So this is the this is just the kind of the overall uh, trend in migration to the US. And so that peaked in 20, 2007. So this is when our oldest cohort is 20. We know that 80% of them actually migrated before they reached the age of 20. So they kind of moved in these early ages. And then our younger cohort would migrate, you know, now basically in, after 2015, when, when migration had become much more difficult. And so this pathway, that mobile pathway um, was, was basically shut or was much more difficult uh, for that group. Um, so then, but so, so despite that, they're still more mobile. So they're also less likely to live in their village of origin. They're more likely to not just have migrated outside of the city, but outside of the municipality. They also say they're more willing to migrate. In fact, pretty much everybody wants to migrate here. Um, and, and if we look at where they are, they're still not in those big cities uh, where there is no, uh, you know, where if they're in the big cities, they basically work as, as domestic workers and wouldn't have any returns to, to, to education. So the, 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 the differential is in, for the older ones, sorry, for these younger uh, groups, in, in, in they're more likely to be in other cities, um, possibly in line, you know, with the higher levels of education. Now, remember, some of them are still studying, and some of this, hence, is mobility because they're, they're studying. They're kind of, they, 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 this is where they are studying, basically. Um, um, the, in the interest of time, let me not say much about this. So, so just on the early childhood code, you were probably thinking about their income itself. We have that, but it's super sensitive because many of them are working. It is positive, it is significant, but how you want to interpret that uh, is, 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 is not super clear. So that's why we don't pay much attention to that. Um, and so this is the result that people were asking for by, uh, by cohort of the, of the early childhood. And so basically we can estimate this based on when you're born, and so what that does is it allows to see whether it's the in utero that matters versus the first year of life, et cetera. But so basically that the bottom line here shows that we, we find no significant differences, but that could be just because we don't have power to find them. And that's true for the income expectations too. So finally, the siblings. Um, so one of the things that, and some of your questions were getting at this, is this really the human capital or is this also just that they had more exposure, they may have gotten more money, can you calculate this out? Now, if it was the money, we sh the siblings in those same households also lived in households that got the same amount of money. And so we therefore uh, partly collected uh, some key information on the siblings of these two cohorts that we have. And so we can look at their education outcomes and their mobility. Um, the, and what, so, so I won't show you all the details, but basically for the, the, two co the, the cohort that was in between 
the schooling cohort and the early childhood cohort. So those that were one to five years old when the program starts, we see smaller but positive effects on education and attainment, which is in line with you know, the ages that people focus on for, uh, for early childhood investments. Um, for, the, for the kids that are nine to 15, but they were not in fifth grade, so either they were early, too late uh, or they were ahead, um, we can also look at them. So the ones that, are, that were further behind this cohort or that are indeed not enrolled anymore, they actually do gain uh, education. They get primary education completed. So that's a somewhat new result. Um, but they, they stop there, as, uh, which kind of is intuitive. The ones that were ahead or the, or the ones that are older, there is, there is no differential in education. There's no differential education. Remember, they lived in households, got the same amount of money. For none of those groups do we see the mobility uh, result. And so, so the and so that's in line with, with, with kind of the idea that's saying it is the role of second of lower secondary education per se that helps. Uh, so the human capital or, or the level or the mobility or the network that comes with going to school uh, that helps uh, explain the, 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 the result rather than uh, just the transfer itself. So let me conclude. Um, so the, what we find is that differential exposure to the condition cash transfer program at late uh, at life stages that uh, that are taught either because of the, well, the, the the broad literature in the case of the early childhood or the specific literature in terms of progressa that we know were critical uh, uh, at, at, that they got the differential at critical stages in their childhood that translates in long term differences in educational attainment twenty years later. We know uh, for the for those kids that for whom this we observe them when they're young adults that leads to gains at all levels of education. Uh, so that's suggestive indeed of of kind of a, a cognitive gain early in childhood, translating in more education um, or better preparation for different levels of education. And they expect that 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 those higher levels of education will get them more income when they're thirty. Uh, they're also more mobile. Uh, um, uh, in, in, in other levels, uh, in, in, in those that have more education are also more mobile. Um, those who finish transition into adulthood, so the, the, the older group, we know that there are higher probability of finishing over secondary school. We knew that already. We know now that when they're 30, that, that translates in higher income, even if it's only, remember the distribution, it was only a subset of them. Part of that is higher income uh, related to income that they earn directly in the US, but there is also a return migration, uh, but there is also this kind of uh, differences in the migration types of different destinations in Mexico. And we also see this, this age of marriage and childbearing that changes. And so overall, kind of the, 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 the pattern of results kind of suggests that it's really important to kind of think of this geographic mobility when we think of the potential returns to education in this type of context. And you, you know, you can ask your question, what's the external validity of this, in particular, given the role of the US migration, and you say that's a Mexico specific thing. Now, what is not a Mexico specific thing is that this is a context with very strong labor market frictions, uh, which Santiago Levy, you know, the, the father of Progress indeed has, has, has written a lot about, uh, and which was one of the reasons where there was concerns about there not being returns to, uh, to the investments uh, in human capital. So despite those labor market frictions, uh, and despite the fact that those kids are getting education uh, in a context where lots of other people in the country also are getting education, they find a way of getting a return to that basically by going somewhere else. And some of that is in the US, but a lot of that is also in other places in Mexico. And so I think that that story more generally is not Mexico specific because labor market frictions and environments where lots of uh, uh, cohorts are getting more education is something we see in, in many other countries. And so then kind of finally in terms of the contribution, so the, the, the 20 year impacts. Uh, so we look, at, we look at the differential exposure to get a sense of what is the potential mechanisms through which 20 years of CCTs in a certain way could have an impact. So it's not meant to have an absolute, to be an absolute estimate. It's just kind of saying, okay, we have a group that benefited a bit more in terms of that translated in better in human capital. How are they doing afterwards? Uh, and so that uh, in, in, in these different mechanisms. So we find those results for the kids that benefited during school going ages, so the education component of the program, but we also find them for the kids that benefited from the health and the nutrition component of the program. And so that, that result in a certain way is, is newer, 
uh, because we knew less of them. But And it's also newer in the sense that we, we actually have very few kind of big programs like uh, Progressa for which we know uh, how investments in early childhood translated in, in outcomes uh, in, in uh, 20 years later. Um, so now the, 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 the very sad uh, afterthought of all of this is that uh, after uh, the, 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 these results were presented and, and, and related results uh, and the government changed in Mexico, the program also changed after 20 years and the early childhood components, in fact, the health and nutrition components were uh, abolished at that time. Uh, um, so the, 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 despite, if you want to, uh, the evidence to the contrary. And let me stop there. Thanks so much, Karen. So now is the time for you know opening up the mic. Um, Kartik had the question at the beginning, so I'm gonna allow Kartik to talk uh, right now. Kartik, you should be, oh. yeah, you should be able to talk now. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Okay, but I guess I I can't turn my camera on. But uh, hi, Karen. Hi, Giacomo. Nice to see you guys. <laughs> the, mm. No, so I had, I had two questions. I think one, uh, so for, first of all, this is great work. Thank you. And uh, tracking, you know, I, I, just any kind of long-term tracking effort is just heroic. So um, thanks for doing this. So I think, I mean, the one basic question I had was given the migration, um, you know, the importance of the migration results, my, you know, concern slash question was less about external validity and more about separating the direct income effects of the transfer and what that may do in terms of just paying the fixed costs and search costs of migration, even for the older generation. Right. So if since it's the older cohort that's benefiting, they maybe were able to use the money directly uh, for some of the search costs, in which case the interpretation is not quite the human capital effect as much as kind of, you know, alleviating multiple constraints of both the human capital and um, the and the financial capital to allow the search. So, you know, I think that's just one uh, broad question. And then the second and maybe this is, you know, early, but it would still be interesting to think about cost effectiveness with a longer term perspective, right? I mean, with these outcomes, and I don't know if that's something you plan to do, um, but but my main question was the first one. Okay, great. And so, uh, thanks for, for those questions, Karthik. So on, on the first part, so the, this is kind of where the, the sibling results come in, but so, so what we know from, so because the, the, the people, the kids that would have benefited the most from the cash transfers coming in, in terms of mi migration, is in fact the kids that just finished schooling, so the 16, 17 years old, um, that were too old to have benefited from this, from, from the, the purchase timing, uh, their households were getting the money because they live in the same households. Um, and what we see is they are not more likely to have migrated compared to, um, to, the, to, the, to the, what was the control group. Now, what is true is that what we don't know is whether it was the human capital and the transfers. And obviously that, 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 that we can't say. It may be that you need to combo to make this happen. But we know from the siblings, I mean, the siblings results have suggested that it's not just the capital. Got it. And then on the cost effectiveness, I mean, it's a tricky question, right? Because, because it is a differential. Uh, so, we, so we could do kind of a back of the envelope for sure and make some, some assumptions on the whole, how the differential tracks and, and to, translates into the absolute, uh, but, but it would be, you know, would be that at best. Yeah, no, I mean, I think like the larger point with cost effectiveness of CCT has always been that the bulk of the money goes to inframarginal households. And so, you know, and I think that will continue to be true over here, but we just now have outcomes over a longer period of time. And so that would, you know, I, I think it's just nice to have that number, I suspect it's not going to be very cost effective on that traditional margin. But once you start have, having labor market returns, then we can look at, you know, like actual economic returns as opposed to just kind of infer that from years of schooling, right? Yeah, I think that's right. And so I think one, uh, thanks for that question, because one of the things that that was on our to-do list, but it's somewhat done, so I forgot, is that, so there was, initial, there was an initial estimate done on those labor market returns, and we should certainly compare our results with those. Um, Thank you. Excellent. So, Carla, uh, your mic should be open, so you should be able to talk now if you want to ask your question. Carla, um, you should be allowed to talk now. You just muted the. Oh. Okay. So, I guess that's not the right time. So, uh, there were a couple of questions before that I actually did not manage to ask. So we're about mostly about power. 
So, and you know, the fact that there are obviously a number of hypotheses being tested uh, as you go. Um, would you want to say something about that, Karen? You know, are you know, are the effects like you know not significant at times just because the standard errors are very large? And how do you see that a little bit? Yeah. Um, no, it's a good question. So, in the certain maybe we, we, the, the there's not that many, and there's I agree there's a lot of results in this paper because there's two cohorts and lots of moving parts. Um, but we 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 since we kept our survey short, there's not actually that many outcomes. Uh, the um, uh, but but so that said, power was a key concern for this evaluation from the beginning because in a certain way we had no choice. What right? we kind of said. The you know the experimental design is what it is. Those cohort sizes are what they are. We have all the kids in those cohorts, and we knew we were on the limit uh, of, of of power doing that. We figured it was an important enough question to try. But so this was not the type of situation where you did your ideal power calculation and then figured out how many kids you were because you have all the kids that are. That makes sense. So, Yoti. Uh, Kiran Shula had the question, so I'm going to allow you to talk now. You should be able to uh, ask your question live. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, hello, everybody. It was an excellent presentation, and especially uh, being a policymaker and from India, we had tracked the study Antyodaya for 10 years. So I am extremely happy to share that, yes, some of the conclusions are matching. But uh, one question which I'd asked was, what are the gender differentials? Are they prominent? Especially in developing countries, the labor force participation and income generation differential in terms of gender for men and women. They were found extremely significant in India. In these uh, observations, I have noticed the gender differentials, but for a long-term study, which is tracking a program for 20 years, I think uh, I would like to know a little more about it. Thank you very much and congratulations. Uh, thank you for that question. And so you're absolutely right. This was one of the, the, the key questions we were interested in too, which is why we, we present the gender differences throughout. Uh, we don't find significant gender differences in most of what we look at. Um, the point estimates for the women generally are stronger. Um, and so, again, this goes back to the, power question, the previous question, is that we, we may just not have enough data uh, to separate this out. Now, the one thing that is very clear, and I think that's going to be similar to, to, to the Indian situation, is that the, the one big difference is one, is one of levels, is that women are working much less. And so, no, the, so only 38% of the women is working. Now, part of this is, is, is probably actually, when we observe them at 30, and because they started childbearing a half a year later, they're also more likely when they're 30 or about 30 to have very young children. And so possibly what we're picking, and this is kind of, you know, the, the, just another illustration of when we do these tracking service and we take a snapshot, it's still only a snapshot. And so the, you know, at this age where we have them, they're more likely to have younger children. So possibly that's why despite having more education, they're not working more. Uh, but that's so what we see is they're not working more. They are, uh, for those that are that are working, they are earning more, and and the magnitudes that they gain seem to be larger. But it's but it's not significant. Uh, thank you very much. Thus, I mentioned specifically the external variables. Thank you. Excellent. So, Peter, you should be allowed to talk now. So please ask away your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, really, really nice. Um, so, so I wanted to go back to one of your original motivations about structural change, and you talk about uh, the migration story within that. Can you shed light, and do you know more on the occupational changes? So whether, whether it's a common path to kind of move from agricultural self-employment to, to self-employment in other sectors to, to low-skilled wages, and do you see a lot of heterogeneity in there, or, or is that a kind of a dominant part uh, that helps us understand these changes? Thanks for the question, Peter. So the, I guess the, maybe that's actually the, the other mobility descriptive I should have, is that what we know is that 60%, I mentioned the 60% of the fathers was agricultural laborers. Uh, 
I think very few of them are actually of the current cohort is still an agricultural laborer. So there is so in in the in the cross section, if you want, in the, in the descriptive, there is a big change. So most of these uh, adults are not agricultural laborers anymore. They work in many different sectors. Um, the but what we don't see is the differential. So we don't see that the, the, having finished lower secondary school um, does not change. The, the type of occupation, at least not at the level where we could pick it up. It doesn't change the type, but it also doesn't change kind of what I would call the quality of the occupation. So whether they have a, a formal job, whether they have uh, some rights, uh, social security rights to their jobs, whether they have more frequent pace. So that's the type of questions we ask. Again, in a very limited sense, but for the questions that we ask, we don't see a change in the, in the type of occupation they have, which is why we conclude that it's more likely that it's the geographical mobility, it's where you live rather than what you're doing that is kind of explaining. And, and so that includes self-employment? So And, and it's a bit in line with uh, with Karthik's question. Uh, it's, it's both a financial and a human capital uh, shift. So yeah, if you push the data, but there I'm certainly uh, in, in, the, in, in the multiple hypothesis world, if you push the data, you can kind of see that demand seems slightly more likely to work in self-employment and commerce. We're having invested in, you know, having some money may, 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 uh, uh, may make sense. So we're, we're having migrated, getting savings and coming back uh, and setting up your own shop may, make sense. But there, you know, that's, that's not robust to any multiple hypothesis. Though. Again, the limits of the power of the study, I think. Great, thanks. This is basically perfect timing. Uh, we are at the end of our red CPR VDEV today. Thanks, Karen, so much for you know this. In, for some of us, incredibly interesting. <laughs> for everyone, I guess. Um, so we, I'm gonna just say bye to everyone. Uh, thank you so much again. We'll see most of you hopefully uh, in a couple of weeks with Penny Goldberg uh, seminar. Otherwise, Karen will be. In our private Zoom room, uh, you should have the link in the chat. Um, please feel free to connect there and you know uh, chat with Karen about this amazing work. So thanks so much, everyone, and bye. See you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 bye.